really close to our time, even though I haven't heard the bell. It'll happen in a minute. The two clocks I can see are off by about four minutes from each other, so we'll just average that out and say it's time to start. We have had lots of sick folks, and uh, some of you tonight here are uh, still sniffing and coughing and such as that, but uh, hopefully uh, the spring will bring some more moderate temperatures and uh, a little more opportunity to get out and about, and uh, we'll have some recovery from uh, the many plagues and ailments that have kept us in and, and uh, away from each other. Uh, if you are back with us, we've, we're glad to have you back, and we will be doing our study tonight, 1 Timothy chapter 5, and um, I hope that we will move into chapter 6 this evening, but I'll make no predictions as such, although we only have a couple of verses uh, to cover. They are not without some challenges, but uh, we'll let that unfold um, as we may. There will be some announcements to be made later in the service, but I'll leave that uh, up to uh, Brother Don to do that for us and bring you all up to date. Let's begin in prayer, then we'll do our study for the night. Father, we're grateful for the day. We thank you for the blessings of life. Father, thank you for giving us each day the things that we need. We're thankful for food and shelter. We're thankful for our home, our opportunities. We thank you for those that love us and that we love. The opportunity to share our lives with those who are around us. The country in which we live. The safety. The privilege. Father, we're thankful for our country. We pray that you will bless those who are in positions of leadership. That the things that are done for us and for this country will be good for your kingdom, good for the world, good for those of us who are citizens. Father, we're grateful for the church at Maysville. We're thankful for our elders and the work that they do in leading and watching over this congregation. We pray your blessings on them. Father, we're grateful for each and every member. We pray that you will help each of us as we serve together. Father, we're thankful for those who serve as deacons and take on and uphold special tasks for us. Father, we ask that you will go with us through each day, that you will help those who have special needs, those who are struggling with illness and sickness. We pray that you will bring and restore them to their place. Father, we ask that you will uh, continue to watch over Brother Philip as he goes through his treatments and that you will help him to uh, be completely recovered and to be able to be strengthened during uh, the challenges that still lie ahead. Father, go with us through the night. We ask that you will forgive us of our sins. When our time is complete, bring us home. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our discussion tonight will begin in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and the 23rd verse. We spent uh, our time last week, as we concluded, talking about uh, Paul's statement to Timothy uh, in regard to... Uh, uh, his selection of elders, his involvement with the church in general. And I left a couple of pieces hanging, but I'm not going to go back and, and uh, grab them up. I could have and, and would have liked to spend a little more time talking about the purity um, that, uh, that Paul identified there. But let's go on and read the 23rd verse. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. There has been much conversation about this little verse. In fact, you might describe it in some ways as a lightning rod uh, for the topic of social drinking. And uh, you can get on the internet and Google just any part of that uh, verse, and uh, you will have uh, at your fingertips dozens of discussions regarding the consumption of alcoholic beverages. I want to uh, spend a little time here, not, not all by any stretch of the imagination, and I'm not going to slide off from this verse into a larger discussion of, uh, of drinking or uh, alcohol in general, although that might be helpful at some point in our discussion here in 1 Timothy, 
uh, it just is not conducive time-wise uh, for us to do the pause that would be necessary. I do want to spend a moment looking at this verse, and we don't have many words there, but I want to consider first some facts and then some deductions uh, from the text. Uh, number one, obviously from this verse, Timothy had stomach troubles and other illnesses. Uh, that's a fact. Otherwise, Paul would not have made this remark. We don't know the nature exactly of what Timothy's trouble was. Uh, we don't know what caused them. Obviously, Paul felt to some degree that they were impacted by his diet. That is, by his water consumption or his soul water consumption. And he believed that uh, either drinking the water that was there in Ephesus or uh, drinking water by itself was creating a problem for Timothy or was making whatever problem Timothy had worse. Now that's a fact. Uh, obviously we've got that here. A third fact, clear, is that he was drinking only water. Now we will, in a moment, spend a little time talking about some deductions that we'll draw from that. Uh, but that's clearly the case. Now Chances are, if today you drink water, and you drink water only, that, uh, that there is some health issue associated with it. Uh, you are interested in water. Our um, health sciences encourage the consumption of water by us as a healthy thing for our lifestyle and for our diets. But what they are trying to get us away from are other drinks, not alcoholic, but uh, sweetened products, uh, soft drinks, Cokes, tea, uh, etc. And so those who advocate water um, say that for a health reason. If you lived in, I was going to say a country, I won't, I don't want to be uh, indicting any people's uh, lifestyle. There are many places in this world where you could live, and if you consumed their water, it would make you sick. Today, it would make you sick. We have, in virtually every city in America, I don't think that there's a place you could go where the health department does not test the public water supply. It's a part of the government system that we live under, which is one of the reasons why uh, our country um, has blessings that we simply cannot imagine. We are blessed beyond measure. When Brother Crutchfield used to come and bring slideshows and pictures, in the early years, um, some of the photographs that he brought when he was uh, talking to churches were stomach turning. And uh, several folks commented to him. I did on more than one occasion. I said, Brother Dean, if you're trying to get people to go with you to India, you do not help your cause by telling them how bad it stinks and how bad the water is and the fact that there's no food that you can eat. I said, you're not helping. You should tell them something else. On one occasion, I remember he showed a picture, and uh, I don't know the location for it, but uh, it showed a, a, a bank in a big city with, uh, it probably wasn't concrete, it was probably stones that had been placed. They went all the way down to the water's edge where the people were, were getting in the water. And here in that water, some of them were bathing. And when I mean bathing, I don't mean swimming. They were bathing. Uh, they were washing their clothes. They were washing their body. They were uh, pulling water out of uh, the, the, the river there in, uh, in jugs and, and big pots and were toting it off, either for cooking or for some consumption, probably for drinking. And in this particular photograph, just a little ways out from the water that the people were, were drinking, there were dead bodies of animals floating there. The carcasses. Of, of the animals. And this is not, I'm not talking about 
uh, birds and dogs. I mean, oxen, uh, water buffalo. I don't know what it was. It was huge. So you got this picture of this, this dead body floating down in this river, no close or no farther away than me to the back of this auditorium or the people who were washing and drinking. And there is no way, A, you would get in that water. The color was nasty. B, you wouldn't drink it. C, if you did drink it, it would kill you. Well, it would make you sick. We live in a very different world than the world Paul lived in, than Timothy lived in. And it's probably hard for us to imagine that in the life that, that they lived, even the most basic things of life are different. When you want clothing, the biggest challenge to you regarding clothing is what you're going to wear because the selection of clothes that you have not only takes up some of the space in your house, but probably consumes several closets. In fact, you have closets, you have so many clothes, your f- clothes won't all fit in the closets that you use regularly. You've got them in storage closets and boxes. And, and they didn't have these things. They didn't have food like you have. So... What kind of water did they have available to them? Raw, untreated, uh, it was not sanitized. It was full of everything you can imagine and lots you can't. And Timothy was getting sick from it. The, The next fact that I'll point out here is that Paul told Timothy to use some wine for his stomach's sake for his health. Now, when we come to the the word wine, we have a challenge. In the Greek, we have a Greek word, oinos. The Greek word oinos does not correspond directly to what we have in the United States of America sold as wine. If you go to a place where wine is sold, and it's hard to not go to a place where wine is sold now, uh, because virtually every grocery store and, and uh, convenience store has got wine. If you go there, you will find bottles and bottles of, of uh, this beverage, and uh, they vary greatly, I'm assuming, or surely they all couldn't, couldn't sell it. They're, they're different. How they're different, I can't tell you. But if you look on the label, you will find a, an alcoholic content, and almost every one of them will say fortified. What that means is that the content of that wine has not produced the alcohol that's in it naturally, but it has been added to uh, through some process of, of uh, strengthening the alcoholic content of that product. Naturally occurring wine or naturally occurring uh, fermentation will only reach a certain point and then it shuts off because the bacteria that's involved, the yeast and such, uh, that develop and make the alcohol as a byproduct, once the alcohol reaches a certain level, it becomes toxic to the, the, uh, the organisms that produce it and it stops. So it shuts off at that point. The wine that we have in the United States typically sold um, has much higher content of alcohol that has been added to it along the way. You cannot tell from the use of the word oinos in the New Testament whether alcoholic or non-alcoholic beverage or product is described by the word. It's the same word. It is used for grapes. It is used for fresh squeezed grape juice, and it is used for grape juice that has been allowed to ferment and become much more like what we would think of as wine. But the word in the New Testament had to be determined by context. They didn't vary it like we do, like we think we do. Some have have argued that uh, what Paul is describing, Timothy drink, is a non-alcoholic product. I understand their reasoning. 
I know that from the word oinos, or from what we translate wine, you cannot determine the nature of it. However, I think it is unlikely that the wine that Paul was suggesting Timothy drink was non-alcoholic for this reason. Um, if we assume that the... Let me back up. W one more assumption. If Timothy had a stomach problem or an ailment that, is, that had, was coming to him because of the water that he was drinking, we're going to assume he needed some relief from that. Now, there are two possibilities. One is that he's going to stop drinking the water that is available, and he's going to drink something else other than water. If that was the case, then grape juice then would qualify. But Paul doesn't tell him to drink grape juice or, or wine only, but rather that he have some, that there be a little bit of this added to the water that he drinks. If that is the case then it seems to me, and I'll stand subject to your judgment, however you'd like, it seems to me that the uh, approach that Paul is taking is that there is an attempt to try to get the naturally occurring um, alcoholic uh, nature of fermented wine to provide some uh, cleansing of that water, that it will kill the things that are in that water. It, it is for the purpose of bringing him some relief. And pouring grape juice, unfermented, into contaminated water seems to me to be foolish. That it wouldn't do anything except give it some flavor. So there has to be, in my opinion, uh, an alcoholic nature to the product that Paul is recommending Timothy use, or I don't think it's going to do much good. Now, having said that, how many of you have NyQuil in your cabinets at home? How about half? How about Listerine or some other mouthwash? If you don't have your, your hand raised up, you need to. Mouthwash is a good thing. <clears throat> I'm taking a little path diverging here, but if someone offers you a mint, take it. Maybe you need mouthwash instead. Uh, no, I'm being mostly humorous. Okay, not very humorous, but mostly. Would there be any problem? You just saw the hands raised. I'm not going to ask uh, 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 the same hands to be raised or hands to be raised. Whether you have other kinds of consumable alcohol that are available to you in your house. But NyQuil has a high alcoholic content to it. You know that, right? You've read the bottle. That's why it burns uh, when you drink it, especially if you've got a sore throat. Several years ago, okay, it's been many years ago, I guess. Time flies, doesn't it? We had taken our children, the whole family, skiing in Colorado, but we took along a friend. We did, took several kids from the, uh, the youth group at Maysville uh, skiing at various times. On this particular occasion, uh, Sarah Williams went with us. Some of you probably rem remember the Williams family. And they went with us to Colorado as a friend of Leah's. Well, we got to Colorado, and she developed a sore throat and, uh, and was sick. Um, well, we're in the middle of almost nowhere. Uh, the nearest town was probably 20 miles away, and uh, it wasn't much of a town uh, where we were staying. And it might not have been quite that far. But uh, she was sick, so, and she wasn't sleeping well, and typical runny nose, coughing, congested kind of thing. And uh, so we gave her NyQuil before she went to bed that night. She never had it. Her first response was when, when she drank it, uh, it, it surprised her a little bit. The next response the next morning was, wow, that was great. I need some more. I'm assuming it was the medicinal properties that she was uh, uh, feeling, that she was breathing better and felt better and slept well that night. We recognize that there is a certain value to alcohol as a medicinal aid. That is not the reason why uh, beer and wine is so prevalent in our country. Most of that is sold as a socially consumed drug. As I said, I'm not going to venture down that path very far. The most logical meaning for this verse 
um, is that the wine that Paul is describing was mixed with the water Timothy had to drink and that that would improve Timothy's health. Um, and since the mixing of unfermented uh, wine with water wouldn't do much good, I don't think, um, it seems to be that uh, it's most likely uh, that this was an alcoholic product that was used. Regardless of what we do with this verse, um, how you translate it, what it's, the specific value is to, uh, uh, was to Timothy, um, this verse cannot be made to justify social drinking. It cannot. Now, regardless of what side of the fence you come down on, and I have uh, well-meaning brethren uh, who believe that no Christian should ever have any alcohol in their body at all under any circumstances at any time, lest it be sinful. Well, I'll point out this verse as a disagreement with that. And anyone who has Tylenol in their uh, uh, cabinet, medicine cabinet, or has accidentally swallowed Listerine. Um, obviously, that is not, well, it's not obvious from that practice. I do not believe that to be sinful. Uh, that does not in any way affect what Paul said to the Corinthians or the uh, Ephesians or Colossians about drunkenness uh, or any other topic. It simply is not involved. But if alcohol was so widely consumed by everyone in Paul's day, as is sometimes offered as um, justification for social drinking today, that everyone did it. If everyone did it, and this was a society that accepted widely, without any question, people drinking alcoholic beverages, why didn't Timothy drink anything alcoholic? Why did Paul have to tell him to do this if everybody did it? Obviously, there are some things that, uh, that we might not be able to do. Um, there are questions that could come up, applications. I want to stop for a moment and let you ask questions about this verse. If your question moves toward the topic of social drinking on one side or the other, I'll defer it because I'm not going down that path tonight. But uh, if you have a question about this verse or a comment, you're welcome to make it or ask it now. Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Loudly. Uh, um, that would be easy. <laughs> I, uh, I would consider myself, I lived a great deal of my adult life as an alcoholic, and I was a social functioning alcoholic. And Paul also writes, everything is permissible, but not everything's beneficial. And that is an incredibly important scripture because there is no reason in our society why any human being would drink alcohol other than medicinal reasons. And I think what is sad is people now that think they are socially drinking are getting high. It is affecting their mind and they like it or they would be drinking grape juice. So they are predisposed to the alcohol and I was very much a drinker and for years and I know what it does to you and I watch people's lives being destroyed and I think it's important to know as a Christian that we are aliens here and that if we look like the world and act like the world, we are not Christians. So to me, everything is permissible, but is it beneficial to the kingdom? And to me, that makes the statement of every choice we make. Is it going to build God's kingdom or tear it down? And when people see a Christian drinking, it tears it down because it excuses their evil behavior. Many years ago, Earl Edwards, who was a missionary in Spain, uh, talked about the subject of uh, 
the consumption of social beverages of alcohol, even in a country where it was widely accepted, and said even there, uh, they looked at them differently, whether or not they did or did not consume alcoholic beverages, even in a country where it was very widely accepted, there was a, a difference in a recognition. Anyone else? All right. Verse 24. Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some follow later. As we look around us, us in the world, it is not judgmental to be able to identify sinful behaviors around us. There is a requirement for us as human beings to function in our world to evaluate the actions of other people. You can't function if you do not evaluate the actions of other people, how they interact with you. You can't stay married if you are not competent at judging uh, the actions of people, the intent of people, the, the moods of, uh, of your spouse, of your children, etc. These things are, are necessary skills. The fact that you can identify whether or not someone is doing something that you believe to be wrong, that skill is a necessary component in life. That does not mean that we are in a position to evaluate and determine whether or not a person is worthy or not worthy of God's punishment, or to decide whether or not a person is or is not in uh, God's fellowship. That is beyond uh, the scope of us as humans, at least in the most regard. There are some exceptions to that, which would be identified in the topic of, uh, of church discipline, and that would especially fall on the elders of a local congregation, although the church might need to function in church discipline with, even without elders. But generally speaking, we are able to tell when people are doing what is good and when people are doing what is wrong. And sometimes those things that people do wrong are known to us. We see them. But not everyone. As an example of that, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I was going to ask how many of you in this audience have had a ticket for speeding in your lifetime. But I won't, I won't ask you to, to divulge that information. My guess is we'd get several hands that there would be a number of folks. I'll only talk about myself. It's been a long, long time since I got a ticket for speeding. Uh, I think the last one I got, my wife was in the car, and uh, we were coming home from Fried Hardeman, and I had passed a car on a straightaway, which was 14 miles long, flat as an arrow. And, uh, but it had been raining, and I didn't want to pull immediately back into the car and just mess up his windshield with the, with the water. So I stayed in the opposite lane a little longer than I needed to, Probably got going a little faster than I should. And when I pulled back into the other lane, I was probably going 10 miles an hour or more over the speed limit. And immediately popped up and there was a state trooper. Well, you can try to argue your case. I said, forget it. I was speeding. The law says this is the limit. It doesn't really matter. I'm not even going to try to work to talk my way out of it. I didn't. Got it. That was the last speeding ticket I've had. That was 30 something years ago whatever, 1980, had to be before 1981, because that's when Lauren was born. So 1980 or something like that. Um, that's not the last time I've sped. That was the last ticket I got. There are things that we do that are found out that are sinful. And there are some that are not. We are able to hide from those who are around us, at least from many of them. They will be done in what we would think of as secret. They would be done in other locations where uh, the individuals who know wouldn't be in, uh, inclined to talk about it or uh, something of that sense. But, uh, 
And it is just as true in the world or in the church. There are people who do things that are wrong, but everyone who does something that is wrong um, is not arrested, is not put in jail, does not have any criminal uh, acts attached to them. Lots of things are gotten away with, we might say. But they won't be gotten away with always. Timothy says there are some sins that come out public up front. I think there is a tendency, and I want to be clear that I um, am properly understood as I make this point. I think there is a tendency for us to look at people who are caught in the act of doing wrong and to judge them harshly. And I would urge caution. Because the fact that we have not been caught in a public act sinning does not mean that we have not sinned. Would you agree with that? In fact, Jesus tells a story about a group of people who brought a woman to him caught in the act of adultery. Oh, how bad could it possibly get? And uh, there have been some uh, who have even speculated that the woman who had been caught in the act had been drugged from the bed where she was involved with an adulterous act directly in front of Jesus. So that you have, uh, as some have described this, uh, a, a virtually naked woman who may have had a, a, a clothing of some sort wrapped around her, drugged with her hair messed up and clearly in the, in the midst of a sinful act. And what should we do with this woman? Well, she should be stoned. She should be condemned. And so they bring her to Jesus. What should we do? The law says this woman should be condemned. And you know the story from John 8. How that as they're there and they, they begin to clamor and they push Jesus for uh, to, to condemn this woman. The law says that she should be condemned. She should be stoned. What are you going to do about it? And they press on him and Jesus does not respond. In fact, it says that he stooped and wrote on the ground. We don't know what he wrote. Many have speculated about that as well. But after some period of time, moments perhaps, Jesus says... Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And the text says that they began to go away from the oldest even to the youngest until none of the accusers was there any longer, only the woman. And Jesus then says to her, where are the people who brought your condemnation? And she says, they're gone. Who is here to condemn you? No one. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Now, in interpreting that, that does not mean that Jesus condoned her sin, only that she was not going to be uh, stoned to death on the spot. We are not put in a place where it is up to us to bring justice to people's lives. And I'm not suggesting that we should close our eyes to things that go on around us that are immoral. We should not. But it has commonly been the case that those who are religious and who try to live righteous lives have sometimes been less than generous in how they dealt with other people in the world. I recently spent a sermon talking about how Jesus interacted with sinners in this world as we addressed the topic of publicans and the fact that Jesus was in the presence of those who were considered sinful in his world. I don't believe that he condoned their sin, but neither did he condemn them to their face. Paul's statement here is an obvious awareness that the fact that some people are found out to be sinful and, and may have a public issue to deal with does not mean they're the only ones who are sinners. In fact, I believe that the whole purpose of Luke 18 
And the statement that Jesus makes concerning the Pharisee and the publican who come before God to pray is to bring this very awareness to us that each and every one of us are sinners. And if we get upon our quote-unquote high horse to bring condemnation down on the heads of others, then it is most likely that we are acting with some degree of hypocrisy because we ourselves are sinful. Now that doesn't mean that if you're a law officer that you are prohibited or uh, because of that uh, you'll not be able to uh, uh, prosecute someone who's broken the law. No, that, that's part of the responsibility. And if you were a judge and it was your job to sentence people to jail or to uh, prison or some other uh, payment for their crime, the fact that you yourself had possibly been guilty of a crime, you would still have to do that. But it ought to give us pause at least to note that the fact that we have not been caught up in a public sin does not necessarily mean that we have not been guilty of a sin that is equally, in some cases, as distasteful to God as those who may have to bear the public embarrassment of a sin that cannot be hidden. The last verse of the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 13, verse 14 at the end of, Paul, uh, at the end of uh, Solomon's discussion in Ecclesiastes, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. But then the 14th verse. He says, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing. It may be that in our lives, in this world, we will not bear the punishment for crimes that we do or sins that we commit. But God will sort those things out in judgment. Every evil thing will come. Every secret thing will come, whether good or evil. In fact, Jesus uh, would go on to say and describe in, um, in his ministry the activities of humanity, and even say that every idle word that a man speaks will be brought into judgment. The concept and, and the awareness that even the things that we say, God will um, cause us to, to be accounted for, ought to give us great humility. And I think that what Paul is doing in describing this is, you may see people and they may appear to be righteous on the outside. That doesn't mean they're sinless. And likewise, you may see people who have, have been known or have been found out to have been guilty of sin. And that does not make them necessarily worse than those who have not. If we are all sinners. When James writes... In James chapter 2. And he says concerning our interaction with, with each other. And, and our faith in God. That the actions that we bring from our lives uh, through faith. Demonstrate what we believe about life. They show who we are and what we are. But after, or before he, he uh, gets into the discussion of faith, a little earlier than that, he says concerning the subject of, of holding, someone, uh, uh, holding partiality or, or prejudice, he said, you judge other people based on insignificant things. You, you look at someone who's dressed poorly and you judge them poorly. You see someone who's dressed richly and you judge them gently or well. And he says, when you do that toward the brethren, you are, you are holding prejudice in your heart. And he says, what you're doing is wrong. And then he goes on to say, If you really fulfill the, the royal law, James chapter 2, verse 8. According to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. If you show partiality, you commit sin 
and are convicted by the law as transgressors. All right, let's pause there for a moment. He said, if you do not keep the law in regard to uh, how you see other people, and you, you judge them harshly, then you are guilty of a sin, a sin. All right? Next step. Verse 10. Whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So, what, Paul argue, or what James argues is, when you commit an infraction against God, you now stand as a lawbreaker. And in that sense, it doesn't really matter which law you break. You are a lawbreaker. Right? And so if you break a law that is part of the law of God, then you have broken a law of God. We in our lives tend to evaluate those laws very differently. And we are comfortable breaking certain laws of God. You are aware of that, right? That we derive a certain comfort from choosing which laws of God we will break and which ones we will not. We decide what are the big sins and the little sins. And Paul's pointing back to that and saying, when you start deciding which ones you're going to look at and which ones you aren't, you've already messed up. The fact that some people's sins are seen does not mean... That they're worse. And the fact that some people's sins aren't seen does not mean that they're not there. Be careful. Verse 25. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. We have both sides of this coin uh, that is used. That is, both of the, the condemnation of people that we, uh, we may condemn... But there's the opposite side of that, and that is the good, the good deeds. There are things that we see going on in the lives of other people that we know of that they've done good. But there are probably things you've also done good that will never be known. We know that there are some people who wanted to know, be known for doing good deeds. Acts chapter 5, we meet a man and woman, Ananias and Sapphira, and they want to be known for doing a good deed. They sell some land, they want to be known as contributing this land or the money from this land uh, to the church. They don't give it all. They are caught. It is exposed. So, uh, Ananias and Sapphira's lives are taken away from them. They're killed by the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 6, and I know our clock's about to get away from us. Uh, I actually, I think I'm just going to spend the remaining time we've got right there. Matthew chapter 6. I want to go read it. Verse 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Now let's pause for a moment. Notice what this passage does not say. This passage does not say, don't do good deeds. It doesn't say, don't do good deeds that might be seen by someone else. It doesn't say, don't do good deeds expecting to be rewarded by God. It doesn't say any of those things. We can do good things. Those good things can be noticed by others. And that does not remove the reward that God has promised for doing good deeds. And we're going to be rewarded for the good deeds we do. But we continue. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Apparently, it was the time. There's no reason to believe that Jesus was facetious in this uh, matter, but rather that it was literal, that people would go out into the streets and that trumpets would be blown before someone did some uh, magnanimous deed. Um, that happens in our world today um, as well. I understand the politics of it. I know that it needs to be done. But there was a certain... I can't explain it, a distaste 
uh, when I was a student at Fried Hardeman, uh, on several occasions when uh, large donors would be uh, brought into the chapel period, and uh, the president uh, would get up and talk about, you know, this individual and, and how much money he was giving to the school. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I don't believe that's exactly what Jesus was talking about here. But I think there could be a problem with that. If a person only had an interest in doing a good deed because they were going to be known for it, then that creates a problem. That's a matter of the heart, and I'm not in a position to judge the heart. Assuredly, last part of verse 2, I say to you, they have their reward. They're not, they may have done a great thing. They may have done a wonderful work. They're not going to get any credit for it in heaven. There's no brownie points for that one. Whatever good deed was done and whatever good reward might have been uh, appropriate because of it, the way it was done for the glory of men, you're, that one's taken care of. That one's paid in full. But Jesus goes on. When you do the charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Now that doesn't mean that it is evil for someone to find out if you have done a good deed. Jesus is countering the very blatant, inappropriate nature of... Uh, uh, of the notoriety of verses 1 and 2. Do not set out to do something good so that you will be known as having done something good. But rather, do it good because it needs to be done. Quietly, privately, and that's of value. Deeds done evil may or may not be known until the judgment. Deeds that are done that are good may or may not be known until judgment. But in judgment, all will be made well. Next week, Lord willing, we will begin chapter 6 on a topic of some discomfort, slavery. I encourage you to do a little work on uh, the topic of the Bible and slavery, and we'll begin discussing it, Lord willing, next week when we start in uh, 1 Timothy 6. Thank you.